I know who's that. Is that you? Did you get any call notification? In your watch, not in your phone. No? Sorry? Oh, no, no, no. Someone is wearing it today. Somewhere. Okay, fine. Let's see. Yeah, probably this should be good. I think so, I think so. But did you get any vibrations? Nothing? Now, now, but no. <laughs> Few minutes back I was playing around. <laughs> I found the one watch here and I just tried to push a text notification. I mean, probably, I do not know if we received it. Okay. So I'm a free software activist from FSFTN. So morning, uh, thanks to Suda, morning she was mentioning about uh, a lot of free software groups functioning in Tamil Nadu, Chennai for a long time, right? So FSFTN is uh, one such group. So I belong to this. So I've been a free software user since 2011, thanks to FSFTN. Since then, I've never been to Windows or any other proprietary stuff, right? So free software is what I use in uh, everyday stuff. So yeah, that's the website of FSFTM. Feel free to visit. Yeah, so uh, one more disclaimer. So I, when I proposed for this talk, I proposed for 10 minutes. I'm sorry, organizers, I'm going to take extra five minutes. Please excuse me. Right? Because when I started preparing these slides, right, I definitely uh, came to know that I, it's not possible to cover in 10 minutes. I have to rush it through anyway. So first thing, before getting into this hack, hacking exercise, right? Uh, uh, let me uh, set the context. So let's go 10 years back, which was 2011, 2010, right? So back then, uh, the the entire idea of uh, free software movement, right? It was centered on these things: FOSS versus proprietary, right? Free and open source softwares versus proprietary softwares. Like say, for example, Linux versus Windows, uh, Firefox versus Chrome, right? Because these were the problems we saw. One is vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in is when a proprietary company builds a software, give it to you to use, much like how uh, Prav, sorry, I, I forgot her name. Badri. Badri. Badri was explaining, right? Uh, there are so many so-and-so apps, but these are all controlled by certain companies. The code is also not free software or not even open source. Right? So that's vendor lock-in. You get into their platforms, that's it. You, you have to only stay in their platforms. Right? There are so many examples for this. Apple is one such example. Right? So, so many examples. Facebook. They don't, they don't interact with any other systems outside. There was a period when Twitter and Facebook was interacting. Even now that's gone. <laughs> it's not because of Elon Musk. Even before Elon Musk, it's gone. So the entire, uh, again, the, the next uh, thing was end user rights. Right? The free software movement was mostly about these four freedoms. I hope most of you know uh, what these freedoms are, right? This is the one of the fundamental axes of the free software movement. Free software movement was never a technical movement. Please don't uh, misrepresent that, right? I just want to request. Free software movement was more about freedom perspective. It's a civil society movement. It's not a technology movement. It's not a, a developer movement. It's a civil society movement. We, we care about these four freedoms. We have to take this very seriously. That's what free software is all about. And then the knowledge commons. Knowledge commons is essentially uh, we all build on top of each other's work, right? That's and then bring everything back into the same pool, right? We take from something, we give it back to something. That's the commons. And uh, free software for that side, Wikipedia, right? So so and so, so many projects got inspired by the idea of free software movement, and then open hardware, etc., etc., right? They all fall under the knowledge commons area. And then we were also talking about fast alternatives. Say for example, I will go and talk to my friends saying, for, 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 for example, right? Uh, Badri was just saying, uh, please use Prava and not uh, some other proprietary app, right? Something like that. What we used to do 10 years back was to go to our friends, say that, come on man, shift to Linux, what do you use? Uh, I mean, to, to call it properly GNU Linux, right? Come on, come on folks, please use GNU Linux, why you use Windows, right? Why you go and uh, uh, get into a cage, why put a chain on your necks, right? That's what we used to do. So these were the uh, uh, what these were the fundamental things that free software movement all over the world was doing ten years back. Now fast forward today, right? The, the landscape has changed. It's not your computers, your laptops, your personal computers is not dominating anymore. What dominates is smartphones, smart gadgets, 
the IoT Internet of Things are everywhere around us. Alexa, smart wearables like this, right? Smartphones, of course. Uh, and even the companies like Microsoft and other companies, proprietary companies, right? They stop selling. I wouldn't say they stop selling. They're still doing that, but that's not their primary business model anymore. They are not selling licenses. They're, sorry, they are still selling licenses. That's not their fundamental mode anymore. What they have done is they have moved to a new model, which is cloud-based SaaS business model. SaaS is both things. One is software as a service, storage as a service as well, right? Today, what is happening? They put all applications to our phones, to our smartwatches, anything. And what they do is they make these laptops or smartphones as a dummy device. It's essentially a thin client. If you know what a thin client is, right? Thin client is essentially meant for just user inputs. There is no CPU, there is no processing involved in there. Right? All of the devices have become thin clients today. Right? The data, the processing, everything is happening on their servers. The data is being collected from us. Right? We are being uh, tracked in real time. Right? Surveillance become uh, um, one of the defining factor of the digital economy itself, per se. All thanks to the government model, right? That's what, that's what happened. One of the disturbing factors is data commodification. If data collection is a problem, massive data collection is a problem, what are they doing with this data being collected? The big data, right? The big data analysis and all, right? Data commodification. Data commodification is essentially commodifying our behavior, right? It is essentially building a profile about each and every one of us, and this profile is a target. Target for multiple things. They will inject an ad into your social media. They will inject, I don't know, elections are up and elections are near, right? You, you are going to see a lot of election related ads, especially from those political parties who have huge chunks of money, right? They are going to definitely do that. You are going to see that. And yes, there are so many things happening. So, this is the context that we are today, right? So, with this context, we have to uh, we have to start thinking about what is the approach that the free software movement should take. What is the those of us here who have gathered for this meeting, right? Uh, who who uh, we identify ourselves as free and open source enthusiast, activist, hackers, whatever, right? We must understand this context, and then we have to take a clear position on how are we going to move forward. Right? It's not merely building a good software. That's a technical part of it. Yes. Free and open source software helps you be, become a good programmer. That's a side effect of it, right? But the free and open source idea itself is the uh, civil society movement. So let's not forget that. So yes, the battleground today is this: data ownership. If the data is generated in my watch about my health vitals, my heartbeat, my breathing patterns, my sleep patterns, right? It's all about me, right? If this data is about me, then who owns this data is the question. Because, uh, let's take the case of amazement, right? Uh, yes, of course, the data ownership is one thing. Digital privacy and autonomy is one thing, right? Digital privacy, what do we mean by privacy? Privacy is essentially not a secret, it's not secret. Privacy is the ability of oneself to be able to reveal certain informations to any third person based on their will. Right? If I if I say for example you are a stranger, someone some of you come and talk to me and introduce me yourself, so and so. And if I have to introduce uh, me to you, I will filter certain information, I will filter and give you only certain information. Right? I decide what should I tell about me to you. That's privacy. That's the control. Privacy is essentially the control we have over the information about us. So this data is uh, information about us, right? Then the question comes, do we have digital privacy today? There are cases, there are people who argue that digital privacy doesn't exist anymore, right? Let's ask to the, there was a famous uh, journalist, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. He, he asked this question, he put forward this question, asking who are, the, who are saying that there is no uh, digital privacy exists today? Are they willing to share their username and password credentials to the public? Right? They are not willing to do, no one will be ready to do that, right? Because everyone cares about their privacy. What, what are they doing? What do they do? Right? So, of course, privacy has to be done. It, is, it, it does exist. Just that these corporations are lobbying, pushing out a narrative saying privacy doesn't exist anymore. Right? Autonomy, again, autonomy is the ability, self control. So, these are the uh, battlegrounds on which we are today. Uh, I 
just cooked up this code. I, no one said this. I just <laughs> thought that I wrote this. Right? What is good for business need not always be good for the public. That's the point. Right? So business may, for the sake of profit, they may do anything like Facebook, like Twitter, right? But that need not be necessarily good for the general public. So let's not take, for, for example, people, there are people who worship Google. There are people who worship a lot of corporations, right? Let's not do that because they are there for making profit and whatever move they move doesn't mean it's always good for the general public, right? Uh, yeah. So according to me, there are certain principles for a particular gadget like this one to be certified as a good gadget or a privacy friendly gadget. One is, it has to be FOSS. Of course, commencement is not a FOSS. The other thing is, it must work offline. It should not require an internet connection to work. Why should I need an internet connection for my watch? There are certain use cases, even if internet, yet, internet is required, it has to be minimal, right? And then local first. So local first is, the data is in your device. Even though this device proxy capability is very less, it doesn't have a uh, after code CPU, doesn't have a lot of memory. Yes, of course, it's a very small device. But it connects to a smartphone, which is powerful enough. So the processing must happen. The data should be in that device. The processing should happen in that device, not in the servers. Right? So that is local first. And then sharing the data with the provider, in this case, again, amazement, should be optional. So if you have a watch from someone, say, uh, Firebolt, or there are some Indian brands as well, right? So you should be able to control whether you want to share the data that your phone has regarding your uh, health vitals with them or not. That should be optional. And of course, the communication must be encrypted. There should be a strong, uh, well battle tested end to end encryption in place. So in that case, let's evaluate if Amazfit is a uh, privacy friendly gadget or not. So the first thing is, I'll also uh, share you my phone screen here. Give me a moment. So there is this app called Zepat. So the bottom, you see, right? This is the app that is provided by the Amazfit company to use with this watch. So what happens is when I use this app, when, when I buy this watch for the first time, it will not work right away. It will not work right away. I have to install this app. I have to pair, pair it with this app for the first time. Without that, even time won't be spent. <laughs> so the point of watch, that's the vendor working, uh, vendor working I was talking about. Oh, sorry, it looks like uh, maybe I'll try. <laughs> Just a moment. I thought I had logged in. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so let me do one thing. Let me not go for Zepa then. Uh, I'm sorry about this. I thought uh, I logged in. Okay, so Zep the Zepa is really a good, good, very well designed app. I mean, from a design perspective, from a UI UX perspective, it's a very good app. Um, yeah, that's that's one thing. <laughs> okay, let me do one thing. I'll just switch a tab. Then and then my password and come back. Okay, I think I'm signed to Let me go back. Yeah. So, yes, I have already paired with this application, so, yeah. So, the user interface, as you see, right, the graphs are very nice, neat and nice. It gives you a lot of, uh, uh, information, it's all good and nice, right? But the problem with this is, you see there is this connecting, it's trying to connect to the watch, to fetch the data from the watch to the phone, and then it doesn't stop there. What it will do is, it will push the data to their servers. You cannot stop it. There is no button to stop that in this app. It will, it will sync the data from my watch to this, and opportunistically, if internet is there, it will push the data. 
So next time, even now, even now, if I disable internet connection, mobile data, or Wi-Fi, the next time I switch it on, the background service will push it. And the only option to prevent it from pushing is to block the particular URL in my phone. <laughs> like, uh, how many of you have heard about an uh, app called Blockera? Right, so there is this app called Blockera. Right, Blockera helps you identify the list of links that are going out from your phone. So outgoing request, you can see all the outgoing requests in real time from your phone. What the, the best possible thing what you can do is you can scroll, look for uh, uh, any uh, Amish or Kwame related links, block it. Right, that's the only best uh, defense we have against this app. Right, so. Okay, just a moment. Now coming back to the uh, slide. Oh, not this one. So, so, tell me yeah. so it requires the Zep app to start the watch and it requires an account. Like I just signed in my account, right? It requires an account on the servers in order to push the data to your account there. Uh, it requires access to internet, of course. It pushes your data to the servers, which I just explained, and of course it's proprietary. So none of the uh, you know principles are matching with. So definitely this is not a privacy-friendly gadget. Right? Those those who know how to uh, uh, you know self-defend them can only defend them. It's not for general public, right? So what is the alternative? What is the alternative, right? Usually, as a free software activist, we talk about the alternatives. So there is only one alternative that I have found today, which is an app called Gadget Bridge. It is only for Android as of today. Uh, so this is the website. So this is the website. Uh, please go, go ahead and uh, try this app over on the smartwatch, right? Uh, there is a list of uh, supported devices here. And uh, I mean, when I was exploring an alternative, that's when I started hacking the smartwatch. Because I wanted to bring more support to this app. Uh, in the sense, this, this app today is not as good as the Zep app. Right? In terms of UI UX, I'm not a UI UX guy, so I'm not. But there is a discussion going on. So if you can, please, uh, go, if, if there are some front end and UI UX guys, please jump into Gadget Bridge, try to contribute to that. But this this particular uh, application, right? It helped me understand how the device communicates with the watch and what are the data that we can really fetch. Say for example, I'm a Python developer, right? So I, I immediately what I thought was, let me try a POC, proof of concept. Uh, let me try if I can pull data from my watch and uh, store it in my local database and do some computations, right? There are so much so-and-so statistics and you know, libraries out there. Let me see if I can do some uh, things locally. If this works, then probably what I can do is I can share this POC to these guys. These guys use Java to develop the Android apps or not. I'm not much into Java. So probably this can help them as well to port certain things there, right? So that's when I started hacking this smartwatch. I created a small Python script, uh, which I named it as PyAmazing, right? Let me demonstrate that. Let's see what it can do, right? So like how you cook, when someone says uh, they are going to cook something, they'll tell you recipes, right? So these are the recipes to do this hack. You need an Android smartphone. Of course, you have an Android smartphone. There is a free and open source tool called Wireshark, which is a very famous tool among uh, penetration testers, right? Wireshark can help you uh, analyze or monitor the traffic, wireless and wired traffic around you. So you can use that to basically see what is the traffic that's going between your watch and your phone, right? especially on the Bluetooth, because they both uh, no, talk on Bluetooth. And then uh, you, you then, as soon as you capture the packet, you try to analyze them, you choose a packet, you look at what data is being sent, you try to replay with your own program and see if, observe the change, what happens to the watch. And then you understand, okay, this is the piece of code that essentially does this thing in the watch, right? Then, yeah, of course, repeat. By doing this for every features in the watch, we slowly, uh, you know, we can build an alternative, or at least a functional alternative with all the features that Zip has, Zip app has, right? So, so, just a moment, again I, I just show you some local traffic that I already have. Oh, I'm already on top of
So the, I mean, I have captured the traffic. These are the traffic that happens the first time I connect my uh, smartwatch with the zip app to the phone, right? These are the traffics. Uh, how, how to make sense out of it? Essentially, you have to understand, I'm not going into these details. There is the protocol called, like HTTP, Bluetooth has something called as Bluetooth GAT, GATT, like General Access Attribute Profile, G -A -G -A -T -T, right? So this GATT, if you understand GATT, you will understand uh, how to read a particular packet. So I'm not getting into those details. Um, but I just wanted to show you a sample of this traffic. Now let's try uh, doing this thing in real, real time. The time, the sense, I said today, right, I wrote a Python program. Uh, let's see what it can do. What information today I was I'm able to fetch. This is still a work in progress. This is not a completed one. I'm still hacking around with this. But if we have to build that, build something. See, when I when I did this exercise, I found this so particular uh, uh, sort of vulnerability, particular hack. Right? Let's see how it works. <laughs> So, so I have my Bluetooth switched on on my laptop. So what this program does is the first try to scan for the nearby amazement device. There is a device, with, uh, okay, it's not able to find it right now. Maybe because it's even not able to find my device. Let's see. I don't know, the Bluetooth seems to be very buggy with the Blue's particular version, which is what is running. Let me disable Bluetooth and the back. Okay, I disabled the name of the Let me try now. Oh, oh, someone is wearing a mask with pop. This is not my watch. Someone is there. Let, let's try that watch. So it's trying to connect to that watch over Bluetooth. Sometimes it will find due to the buggy. Yeah, so it happens. Maybe you are so away. I do not know who that is. You are so distant. Can you come forward, please? Can you come forward? At least nearby to my laptop, please. So that ah, we have three amazing people. One is oh, even now I don't see my device. Okay, let's try it. Yeah, twenty-two. Is that that's pop, right? Amazing pop. Okay, let's pop. Pop, yes. Yeah. Okay, connection refused. Let's try some other device. Sorry, but but be here. Sometimes it may work. Still, it shows your watch. No, it doesn't work. I am wondering why my watch is not so. I am very close. Your watch is not paired paired with your own phone. It is open for other devices to pair, so which means someone like me sitting in a crowd can connect to any specific watch. I'll show you what I mean. I'm just trying to <laughs> make it work. It works there, but not here. <laughs> See, basically, I can read a device serial number. I can read the device firmware version, hardware version, software version. These are also critical information. If I know what specific firmware version this watch is running, and if I know this particular version has a particular critical bug or vulnerability, one a hacker can essentially you know utilize it to uh, do it, right? Okay, let me try. I am not sure. I I. It can be green. Yeah, but that's not the objective. Yeah, yeah, that's not the objective. I posted this in Twitter, tagging them. They thought this is a problem in my watch. Right? And then they said, please email to us, we'll fix your watch. Okay. 
Thank you. 